I want to welcome you to another of our Institute Encounters. Today our guest uh, is Professor Mark Dryerson, who is Professor of Kinesiology at Penn State University. He's the author of American National Pastimes, A History, uh, and Crafting Patriotism, which I guess is a study of how sports imbues people with national feeling. Indeed. Well, welcome. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, we have, this is the first time uh, in our series that we have taken up the very important subject of sports uh, in the Western world um, and in American history. Uh, and I, I gather that uh, you've given a good deal of thought to the relationship between sports and the development of professional sports, let us say, of kind of highly organized team sports. Uh, and um, a democratic, uh, the sort of democratic ethos, the democratic spirit, the nature of republicanism, things like that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's a question that's fascinated me for years throughout my career that uh, there certainly is a strong connection in terms of the people who in, invented modern sport in the Anglo-American world, that their notion of sports purpose in, in a community was really to build uh, Republican culture uh, in the transition from a more traditional universe to a modern one uh, with the loss of uh, uh, agricultural and rural and um, agrarian roots of republicanism. Uh, thinkers were scrambling about for ways to preserve in an urban industrial era the, the kinds of virtues and values of republicanism. And uh, in Great Britain in particular, and in the English-speaking world, um, there was a, a huge uh, push to use sport as a tool to uh, preserve republicanism. Now, when you say republicanism in Britain, what is, since that's a monarchy, what exactly right. do you mean by that? Uh, the, the, the small r republicanism, mm -hmm. uh, the notion that uh, nations need constitutions, some kind of s separation of power, some scheme for the representation of different interest groups, including the mass public uh, in Parliament in Great Britain, uh, legal mechanisms, uh, limits on arbitrary power, mm -hmm. the sort of classical notions of republicanism, law abiding law, mm -hmm. the, the, the law abidingness by the by the citizens, and, and a citizenry that has some uh, baseline level of virtue. If you're mm -hmm. going to trust the people to to ultimately rule, to have the final say, uh, it's been a question in the West always: How do you ensure that those people who have a say have the virtue and wisdom to? Uh, make wise decisions. Who, who are some of the people who thought about these questions? Uh, they're certainly older than the modern world. The, mm -hmm. the ancient Greeks and Romans thought about these questions extensively mm -hmm. and thought about the role of the body and of the training of the body and of athletic competition and its relation to these questions. In Britain in this era, the people thinking about them uh, are um, intellectuals like uh, John Locke and John mm -hmm. Melton, who write some on uh, the importance and power of sport in training the citizenry. Uh, in the United States, William James, the uh -huh. pragmatic philosopher, was a huge mm -hmm. fan of sports. Perhaps the, the uh, in the United States, the, uh, the the key figure that was Theodore Roosevelt, the sort of mm -hmm. polymath president of the mm -hmm. United States, who was interested in a wide variety of things mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uses sport in, in numerous ways and and pushes its uh, acceptance in American culture as a citizen training system of uh, values. What, what, did, what did Milton and Locke have to say? That's a, that, that'll sound novel to a, a lot of hearers that they address this topic. Yeah, they, they, some, they occasionally use sporting analogies when mm -hmm. they talk about constitutions, oh, the sort mm -hmm. of rules of the game mm -hmm. notion, I think, and as a way to uh, prepare the ground for pushing their ideas. Milton was particularly interested in using sport to train Protestant soldiers in the English Civil War. Uh, there was a huge debate, you know, the sort of the, the Puritan notion. Uh, the Puritans have been often portrayed as anti-sport, sort of dour, mm -hmm. um, fun-hating, mm -hmm. uh, killjoys, uh, as opposed to uh, the Elizabeth Elizabethan era in Great Britain. But in fact, Puritans had a very, like Milton had a very modern notion. They did. Uh, there was a strong animus towards sport on the Christian Sabbath, and they were. Um, 
not well disposed to uh, the older medieval traditions that involved gambling and drinking and sports at regular festivals, but they thought that sport as a tool to make you a better member of your church, a better parent, um, uh, a better child, uh, a better citizen in the community, a better soldier. Of football, early, yeah. uh, uh, very early versions of football, uh, anything strenuous, running, horseback riding, often sports since they're ta- thinking as the Greeks did about the connection between sport and warfare, uh, sports that have a, a martial element, um, fencing, um, a whole variety of games, traditional folk bat and ball games that were popular in England, uh, that uh, Melton endorsed all of those as proper training for Christian young men in the, the, in the Republic, he, the Puritan Republic. And all this is a, is a very peculiar Anglo-American kind of invention. At this time, it seemed to be, there were certainly, uh, in the Italian Renaissance, there are thinkers who were resurrecting the notion of a sound mind and a sound body and counseling sports for the elite, for the princes, that physical education and athletics is a part of these new schools you see returning to Europe uh, in the Renaissance and after. But it's the fullest expression is in England. Uh, the greatest interest is in England and the place where what we would think of as high level elite modern sports are there. It's going to be born in Great Britain. So when the Duke of Wellington says that the Battle of Waterloo is won on the playing fields of Eton, he's thinking in this way. Indeed, though probably apocryphal, it's unclear whether uh, the Duke of Wellington ever said it. It's a British truism, and he should have said it had he, if he didn't. Uh, so this notion is around uh, by the middle, probably, of the, the 1700s of the 18th century, and certainly by Wellington's time and thereafter, that schoolboy ethic, that belief that lessons learned outside of the classroom uh, on the playing fields of Eton or Harrow or rugby are more crucial than the Greek and Latin the boys are learning uh, in the classroom has become a very popular notion uh, in the entire English-speaking world. The classical text there is a wonderful little novel, Tom Brown School Days, mm-hmm. once much read, now neglected. Made a good television series, though. Made a good television <laughs> series, indeed. It was an interesting. Played a little fast and loose with the book at times, <laughs> but. Uh, don't ask me whether I want to lose, but how I played the game, I guess, also that another British ad. Another that, British ad. That suggests all yeah. this. Now, it, it was really a rediscovery because in the ancient world, it was also an organized professional ancient recent Rome particularly uh, organized professional athletics uh, is there it, and, and of course those were also political environments in which there was a notion of citizenship and participation Uh, Do you think there's a a linkage there between those two things at at either end of Western history? Absolutely. And the British in the 19th century and before the 18th century as they're building modern sport resurrect Greco-Roman notions of the the key importance of sport in in a culture and a civilization. Now they misread it sometimes, as is the case with amateurism. Uh, and stress certain emphases, but they they are hearkening back uh, in almost every justification in Great Britain in in that era of why you would waste time on mere amusements in a school, uh, they look to the the Greco-Roman heritage. Um, and it's fascinating, I think, in, in, in Greece particularly, Rome was probably more interested in spectatorship than actual participation. And Rome gives us, you know, monumental stadiums and the cult of the fan and things like that. Uh, but in Greece, athletics was tremendously important uh, in the culture of the city-state and enormous debates in those city-states about whether or not they should train what was the purpose of sport? Was it the training of elite athletes for uh, to win favor with the gods and fame for the city-state and uh, the ancient Olympic Games and the other Pan-Hellenic festivals that were held? Or was the purpose of sport the general fitness of all of the citizenry uh, training the masses of the polis, particularly for defending the city, say, mm-hmm. the sort of citizen-soldier notion. Uh, you see it in Plato's Republic, where Plato comes down very much on the side of not favoring intense elite athletics, but general fitness, physical education for all in his ideal uh, uh, city-state in the Republic. And so this argument that we still have in the contemporary world in a school system in the modern United States or any nation 
Should we be nurturing excellence among the few, varsity athletics, or should we be um, really using sport and athletics for the general welfare of the entire population? Uh, that debate is an, is an unending, in, unending one in Western culture. Physical education requirements have been much attenuated, haven't they, in recent decades? There have been efforts to, to raise them, to alter them, to make them fit different parameters. Um, you know, it's a, a constant issue. There's a series of crises when the United States, I think, is in a period of, um, of um, angst about the world situation. It often looks at the health of its youth and decides it's uh, too feeble to stand up to uh, whatever particular uh, villain uh, is inhabiting the world at the time, and then there's an effort to ratchet up physical education requirements in the schools, lest we uh, become soft and weak. The sort of, you know, and it, that dates back to ancient Greece as well, the Athens versus Sparta mm -hmm. trope, which was always oversimplified, but, you know, this this idea of what makes the good society? Is it is it the, the Spartan dedication almost entirely? And the Spartans initially were the great athletes in ancient Greece, but then went down the road where they they began to assume that athletics was not as important because it diverted them from the central purpose of their culture, which was warfare. Uh, and then, so they become the sort of narrow physical training for warfare, whereas the, the Athenians had a much broader, richer tradition of athletics, partly, partly certainly training for warfare, but um, the aesthetic values, the artistic values, uh, the nurturing of excellence, and, and, and so that dichotomy. Um, have, we, have we lost that connection in the way that we regard sports nowadays? between citizen and Republican virtue on the one hand and athletic activity on the other, teamwork and civic cooperativeness. Is, is that gone or is that still part of the way university, uh, for example, physical ed programs think or um, little league, stuff of that kind? I mean, you can hear a speech from a coach practically every day in the United States uh, telling kids that uh, it's not as important that they become great athletes, but these lessons they're learning in competition in junior high or high school will serve them well for the rest of their lives, will make them productive citizens. So I don't think the rhetoric or the ideology is gone in any way, shape, or form. You see in physical education programs across the United States a huge effort to try to get the American public to uh, focus more on the good of all than the good of a few mm -hmm. excellent folks. That's been a long battle because there's there's been a tendency to forget about the many and, and just nurture the talented and, and put all the, the time and emphasis and money into elite athletics. Um, and I think, you know, I think that remains a problem in American culture. We have millions of parents who put their kids on travel teams and harbor dreams of, of winning athletic scholarships uh, and keeping the balance, uh, which the ancient Greeks struggled with, the balance between excellence and the good of all mm -hmm. is, is, is a difficult issue. Certainly contemporary American culture finds it a tremendously difficult issue. And we have kids that play too much, too young and burn out. We have parents that are overly involved. My, my greatest criticism would be that youth and child sport in the United States is too much about adults. Part of in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century when it took off in the US, part of the argument was in fact that in learning to organize their own games, children built the skills to be uh, good citizens of a republic. That that kind of negotiation, that playing by the, without adult supervision, mm -hmm. that uh, learning, learning those virtues at a, as a child was crucial uh, to, uh, to, to, to making a good republic. There's a wonderful um, cover shot on uh, a magazine uh, journal that was called Play The Playground, which was devoted to um, the general recreation for the masses. Uh, and it's a shot from an urban city uh, with a mixed group of kids, ethnically mixed group of kids, and the subtitle, and they're, they're playing uh, basketball, and the subtitle is uh, the team versus the gang in the Republic of Play. Mm -hmm. uh, and this notion that self-organization mm -hmm. is, is a, a crucial component that you see uh, in British schoolboys as well. So I was going to ask that. On the playing fields of yeah. Eton, exactly. uh, it, you, you don't have the headmaster out there uh, no. telling them what to do. They just sort of 
turn out on the field and organize a game. And that's the message of Tom Brown school mm-hmm. days. The adults weren't around. The boys had to do the, the, this themselves. And there were trials and tribulations, and there was hazing. You know, there was flashing in the bully. But that ultimately, uh, the boys do organize their own games, and they are able and capable of doing that. I mean, the great response in Western literature to that notion that youth are able to organize their own activities in productive and civil ways, which is a, a, another novel in the tradition, uh, uh, in the English public school boy tradition, is Lord of the Fly. So you've got, you've got the converse notion left to their own devices. They descend into anarchy and chaos. But there's a whole tradition in Britain and the United States that runs the other way, that they have to be let uh, left to do this of their own. Now, when I was a, when I was a kid, uh, much long, longer ago than I'd uh, care to admit, um, you went with your bat or your glove uh, down to the local park, and there were a group of other kids who you pretty much knew, uh, and they chose up sides, as the the, the saying went, uh, and played softball or something else. Basketball. Uh, does, 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 is that culture still alive on our playground? It's been superseded by kind of quasi professionalism. Sadly, I think it's disappearing. Uh-huh. That long tradition of pickup games and sandlot uh-huh. games and self organized games has diminished in part because there's enormous amount there's an enormous amount of money and there are it's a to be a youth coach coach is a profession and parents are overly involved and you know there's markets for selling uniforms and t-shirts and uh they pay tremendous money often to be able to travel in in brooklyn i could walk three three blocks of the park exactly suppose you have to drive to the park then the parent has to come along well and that's i think that is the great change in american culture that where once upon a time we were much more willing as parents to let our children mm-hmm. our children wander freely without adult supervision you know I have kids of the age now who would play pickup games if I were look to let them just go to, out to the local park they live close enough we live within a couple of blocks they could walk down there I think every other parent in my neighborhood would call social services <laughs> and I'd be hauled off to jail I'm a horrible parent that uh, uh, parents just will not leave their children alone and hence everything has to be organized and adult supervised and scheduled mm-hmm. and all the coaches have to take their clearances and background checks we become you know in that sense a nation of uh, people who are enormously frightened and, and that that's really altered altered the dynamics mm-hmm. um, I was struck when I traveled in Japan that apparently that um, behavior and culture hasn't reached Japan yet, where you see school children unaccompanied by adults in their uniforms, traveling on the subways, walking around, unaccompanied everywhere. Uh, And so in Japan, that change has not been made, but I know in a lot of other countries uh, in the industrialized world, they're like the United States, where parents always supervise their children and know where they are. And and I think that's really um, uh, a negative consequence of the contemporary world we live in. Stephen Pinker, the Harvard um, psychologist and social theorist, has sort of argued that, in fact, if you look at the figures, violence has declined very greatly over the last 50, 60 years. So it doesn't sound as if the risk is necessarily any greater. We yeah. just are more apprehensive. We're I think kind of so. Risk averse. Right. All the studies show that you know the chance of a, a stranger abdu- abduction, every parent's worst nightmare. You let your kid go to the park mm-hmm. to play that pickup game to teach them Republican values, and they never come back. The chances of that happening are, are astronomically uh, not in favor of it happening. But modern parents are just this fear, mm-hmm. uh, and, and then a culture. Um, what makes it difficult for a parent like me who would like to do that is that if none of the other parents are letting their children walk to school, ride their bikes unaccompanied, go to the park and play unsupervised, it does become more dangerous. You know, the parents aren't there, the, the, the parents aren't at, at, at home as much watching, there aren't lots of children on the street paying attention. And you're suggesting you bear a stigma too. And, and of course there is the stigma, which all parents want to avoid stigma. Want stigma is right. So, so, um, in, in a less risk-averse society of the past in America, uh, American sports certainly had a strong nationalist component. Um, in fact, uh, what we long took to be the national pastime, uh, in part developed as it did uh, because of a sense of national separateness. Um, could you could you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, baseball is a fascinating game. I think historically, any historian of baseball would tell you that in spite of the Cooperstown myth, which so many baseball fans read when they make the pilgrimage to uh, upstate New York, that baseball was invented on a bucolic summer day uh, without any influence from British mm. uh, traditions, British bat and, bat and ball games like rounders, uh, then in fact, baseball uh, emerges out of these British bat and ball games that come over in the colonial period and flourish in the early United States. And originally, it's not the bucolic field of dreams agrarian game, it's an, an urban game, a new and modern one, invented in New York City uh, by middle class men uh, who are looking for some, a little bit of excitement in their otherwise dull and corporate lives. Uh, it, it, it appears at a time, cricket is also an enormously popular sport in the United States at that historical moment in the 1840s and 50s. Uh, cricket was especially popular in Philadelphia, the most British city at that time mm -hmm. in the U.S. There were dozens of cricket clubs. Uh, and so there is this period in American history we've forgotten about where it was an uncertain outcome whether or not cricket or baseball would become the American national pastime. Baseball had the virtue of having its rules, although its roots are in Britain, its rules written down in the United States and, and uh, it was much more easy to associate it uh, as the American game versus the more aristocratic uh, cricket that took a long time. It was already, already well established All in Britain, so Britain, right. it was no, no, no easy way of putting an American stamp on it. Absolutely, mm -hmm. you couldn't disguise it mm -hmm. uh, as a, 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 a proto English speaking game. It was clearly, and not just British, it was English, which also made it a difficult sell in Ireland and other parts of the English speaking world. Uh, and. Uh, it comes at a time in which the United States, I think, is asserting its separate identity from Great Britain. This is the era when Mark Twain is calling for an American literature, an American vernacular. If you think of baseball in the same way, it's an effort to write a team bat and ball game uh, that serves the same role as cricket in Britain, but with uh, a red, white, and blue uh, heritage and tradition, and so that that's the key to baseball becoming the American national pastime. And, and the role it plays is a it's a vehicle. Well, obviously for having a good time, but also a vehicle for making a certain social statement about the players. It is. Um, you know, baseball was supposed to teach the kinds of skills that middle class people would need to be successful in a modern urban industrial economy. Teamwork, the willingness to sacrifice one's own interests sometimes for the betterment of the whole, uh, shrewdness, intelligence, you know, not just physical skills. Mm -hmm. Baseball was considered very much an, an intellectual game, a mental game. Um, George Will would agree to George that. Will, <laughs> indeed, there is a George Will and a, a, a great many American intellectuals gravitate much more to baseball than any other sport because it's supposedly uh, the intellectual sport. I guess they never spent much time with Yogi Bear or Mickey Rivers or <laughs> some, uh, some anti-intellectual well, you certainly baseball have a lot of time players. to think about the game in baseball. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. Although once upon a time, we think of it now as a ponderous and slow game. That's the criticism when it first appeared. It was the modern, fast-paced, dynamic game, if one can imagine. Well, compared, compared to, to Rick, I suppose, right? Yeah, that mm -hmm. took a day or more to play. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> And the organizers were did they were they groups of people did they form corporate bonds with each other right at the outset? Uh, right, these are groups of, of men initially who assemble in New York of their own volition. They have an interest in, in the game. They tended to come uh, in that era, the very first phase of baseball, from the lower middle classes. They're upwardly mobile. They have a uh, intense desire not to be a part of another sporting world that existed then, uh, the sporting fraternity in uh, New York saloons and taverns that swirled around things like prize fighting and um, blood sports, cockfighting, horse racing, uh, pedestrianism, early sort of foot races, track and field, mm -hmm. on which there was a, there were professional athletes who participated. Lots of gambling connections to the underworld and crime and corruption. For an upwardly mobile, aspiring middle class bank clerk, that would be the kiss of death in one's career. But they wanted some of that excitement. Uh, and dynamism that came 
with sport. And so they, in fact, called themselves in distinction to the sporting fraternity, the baseball fraternity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still what um, the owners of businesses and corporations, the, the upper middle class was initially suspicious, thinking, you know, now you're just drinking and gambling. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why in some ways the prohibition, the prohibition against drinking and baseball has long since disappeared, but gambling remains mm -hmm. the original mm -hmm. sin. And, mm -hmm. you know, Pete Rose, that's the reason he won't get in the Hall of Fame. He could have committed uh, no, numerous felonies and been in the Hall of Fame, but gambling on baseball is, what, is well, the original Had he been sin. a football player, would it have made much difference? Uh, I, I think it would have made a tremendous difference that football emerges about uh, 30 or 40 years later in a different context. Would Pete Rose have gotten away with making side bets if he had been a quarterback? <laughs> in, indeed he would, as long as he had bet on his own team, which he apparently did, I think, in football mm -hmm. or even basketball. Although there's a history of point-shaving scandals mm -hmm. in basketball, mm -hmm. he would have been more easily forgiven. Mm -hmm. It's baseball that has that animus because of its because of its history. Did baseball very quickly draw um, a fandom? A lot of people who'd come out and see these games? Was that it did. part of the original culture of the sport? At first it was a sociable game and you were invited to join the mm -hmm. club and the, the men sponsored dances uh, afterwards to which they would bring young ladies. So it was part of the social swirl of New York City. Fairly quickly the working class gets interested, other people get interested, clever entrepreneurs figure out that you can make money charging admission to games. Mm -hmm. Um, initially, it's supposed to be it's sort of modeled on British sports, an amateur game. You're not, uh, you're not supposed to take any money for your performance. But very quickly, as the teams become emblems of the pride of a neighborhood mm -hmm. or an ethnic group, their organ or a profession, you know, you have teams of teachers, teams mm -hmm. of butchers, uh, Italian teams, uh, Irish teams. Um, as they, they become symbols of identity and, and winning in these contests of status matter under the table payments begin to happen. Uh, it's the same sort of story that's going to happen a few decades later with British soccer and fairly quickly within 30 years of the uh, the invention, if you want to call it that, of baseball, professional leagues are popping up and players are being openly paid and it's, uh, baseball's become an industry as well as a game, as well as a pastime. Now, now you see a connection between fan interest in teams and in, in, in the sports, uh, but particularly in teams, their identification with the teams, and the sort of anonymity and personality of, of urban life, which is sort of coming into play in a big way in the 19th century. And what, is, what is that connection? I think uh, one of the, the key issues in the rise of modern sport is this perception among people in these modern cultures that uh, while there were tremendous benefits to progress and technological development and industrialism and indeed or even urbanization, uh, they um, were steeped in this older tradition that comes from classical ad antiquity uh, of antipathy toward urban places, uh, that those were the dens of vice and iniquity that would erode re Republican values. Uh, but clearly they've made a calculation. They're not going to move back to the family farm and wake up at dawn and work all day, although they write glowingly and admiringly about it. Uh, the city is where the action is. It's where the jobs are. It's where uh, your, your life is to be made. And so they're looking then for institutions, uh, structures that can provide um, some of the the training in Republican values that one used to get on on the family farm in a more agrarian world. But, but, but for the spectator, there's also the sense of community, of belonging, that yeah. he may have lost yeah. in coming from the little village to the great big anonymous city. And, and uh, you know, the thrill of belonging seems to be one of the most important parts of being a spectator, whether you win or lose. Absolutely, so that since you're new in a city, the easiest way to fit in is to begin rooting for the team that your neighbors win, uh, root for, the Cubs or, or never the Yankees, I know for you, but the Dodgers or, or what team. It, it, it provides an instant connection, an instant bond. And there's that fascinating process that I think anyone who's a fan uh, goes through, I know that I do, where you begin to see, uh, you begin to talk about we, 
instead of they. The, initially, it's the, the players themselves who were, this, this is a fraternal organization. They're sociable, but pretty soon the people that watch it or even read about it, most fans did not go in person. They The mm -hmm. big connection is through the print mass mm -hmm. media. They read the daily newspaper is mm -hmm. crucial in building that mm -hmm. loyalty and the talk and the uh, the, uh, the, the swirl of media attention is the key component of this. And so we engage in this fiction and we all do it as fans. We talk about we, we Texas Tech or we Penn State are gonna be, uh, in our case it would be Ohio State and yours the University of Texas. Uh, when we don't play on the football team, we have no, um, it, it always strikes me as amusing all that talk about we when only probably 40 players who get on the field are going to have any impact on the outcome, but there's a belief among fans that they can alter the outcome of the game just by showing up and cheering more loudly. There, Is there any truth in that? I, I don't think, I, I think better players are probably a better way to success than a rabid fan. I mean, is there a home but, team advantage? But there, is, there are in many sports, there's certainly the perception of a home team advantage and uh, having a, a great rooting section uh, can have at least some influence on the game. But I, when you cross over from them to we, I think you see the power mm -hmm. of communal bonding that mm -hmm. exists in, in, in sport. I've told students at Penn State, we have a famous chant, we are, and then the other side of the stadium is supposed to answer Penn State. And it's an iconic chant that if you wear Penn State paraphernalia, and I've been in Tokyo in an air, airport and uh, had a child with me who had a Penn State shirt on and people would walk by and go, we are, and he was supposed to say <laughs> Penn State. And I've told students, you know, that that's such a bonding moment on a huge campus with 44,000 students and new freshmen who are suddenly thrust into it, don't know anyone, have that sense like in a new city of alienation uh, and, and, and feeling anonymous and disconnected to go to Beaver Stadium with 108,000 people and champ, we are, Penn State is, is mesmerizing a mesmerizing social dynamic. I've compared it tongue in cheek to, you know, uh, being at the Nuremberg rally or having watched Triumph of the Will and uh, being, uh, you know, uh, like all uh, good modern Westerns, uh, thinking Hitler is the devil incarnate, but you hear him speak and it's mesmerizing and the Zeke Heil, that, that bonding moment and, you know, your arm unconsciously starts to hopefully, rise. Football is the moral hopefully equivalent, the moral of, equivalent, equivalent of the Nuremberg <laughs> rally. One, one wonders at times if it is, but one hopes it's it's the moral equivalent. Of so it. so it's, it's, it's very interesting to see sports as a reflection of human nature, as a reflection of social organizations of various kinds, uh, different types of societies. Um, that's sort of the effect of the context on the sport. How has American sport, just to take that example, how has American sport changed the rest of the culture? Right, and I think one of the most interesting questions scholars who study sport confront is the issue of, is sport a reflection, and that's easier to see, of social dynamics and patterns? Of course it is. Is sport, though, ever an active agent of change? Do you see places where sport leads the charge? And, you know, I think that um, there are moments in American history. Uh, one I would point to is the, the integration, or more properly, reintegration of baseball in the 1940s, because People forget there were a handful of African American players in the early major leagues, never in the National League, but some of the other uh, leagues who played. And then a color line is drawn about the mid 1880s. So Robinson is the first, Jackie Robinson's the first to return since that point in time. And when you think about it, uh, there's a wonderful book by a guy named Jules Tigell called Baseball's Great Experiment. Uh, the experiment is an integration. Can a, an institution uh, filled with uh, uh, a lot of white uh, people, a lot of white Southerners peacefully accept uh, the um, the integration of of, 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 of blacks in, into its uh, structure without just exploding. And when Robinson signs with the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1946 uh, and then plays a year in Montreal and comes up in 1947, we forget how early it is in the post-World War II civil rights movement. This is before the integration of the U.S. military by executive order. This is before um, uh, 
Martin Luther King becomes a national figure, before a lot of the boycotts and protests, before the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, before um, uh, the great court cases, uh, Brown versus the board and the other court cases. I mean, Jackie Robinson's the canary in the mine. Uh, he is truly, and he wrote about it at the time, the pressure he felt that if he failed, he wasn't just one baseball player failing, he was letting down his entire race and probably retarding uh, progress on civil rights for decades. That's what he himself believed. And so that that experiment worked uh, and that whites uh, accepted an African-American How player. near a thing was it? I think it was nearer than we remember on several levels. First of all, you know, Robinson did not perform, given that pressure, you know, early in some of the spring train, those first spring trainings, he looked like he wasn't gonna be able to make it. And you can imagine how many athletes would have crumbled, no matter how good they were, would have just crumbled under that tremendous pressure. So I think it was, closer than we think on the field and you know it, it even more showcases the greatness in, in, in on multiple levels of Jackie Robinson himself to be able to deal with that situation and then I think it was closer than we think in baseball. Uh, Ricky did it with the Dodgers, who were a team on the margin of baseball at that time. Uh, and Ricky was looking at it partly from Branch Ricky, the general manager who pioneered it, partly from um, um, humanitarian reasons. He had been raised in a family that had roots in the abolitionist movement and and and, and educated to, to treat all well, human beings. Rather deeply religious family. Deeply right? Ohio Westland, deeply mm -hmm. religious family who in fact were never happy that uh, he became involved in professional baseball and not a minister or a teacher. Was Robinson religious too? Uh, Robinson was religious as well, uh, perhaps not as devout as, as Ricky was, but certainly uh, Robinson himself was a regular churchgoer uh, and often used uh, religious tropes to talk mm -hmm. about his mm -hmm. experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it was closer than we think that, you know, Ricky faced a lot of opposition from other uh, major league owners. They did not want to do it. They secretly met and, you know, planned, uh, promised not themselves to uh, uh, recruit black players. Uh, eventually their resistance wore down. Um, and it happens more slowly than we think. It, it, it seems in retrospect, all of a sudden black players flourished. You know, Robinson broke the color barrier. Robinson played for 10 years. From 19 in, in the major leagues from 1947 to 57, the year he retired, there were still four teams that weren't integrated that did not have black players. Uh, the Yankees were one of them. Uh, the Yankees had just uh, had just I think in 1956, so about a year before, mm -hmm. signed Elson Howard. Uh, but it is the Phillies, the Red Sox, the Cardinals, and I'm going to forget the other one, <laughs> and, and another team. Uh, it might have been Detroit. Um, um, that had not yet signed um, an African-American player. The Red Sox are the last team in Major League Baseball. They wait until 1959. Kind of odd, considering the abolitionist history of Massachusetts. Of Boston, yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. So there's an interesting is there, is there a story there? Or is it just um, I think ownership. There was some uh, intense resistance uh, among ownership mm -hmm. uh, among the Red Sox, and then I think broader patterns that Boston had changed by that point in time. Broader, broader patterns in, in in Boston culture. That remember that Boston is a hotbed of resistance to uh, uh, busing mm -hmm. uh, for uh, integration in the 1970s, mm -hmm. and had uh, a lot of problems with a very uh, ethnic city. Yeah, very ethnic city riots in the Irish neighborhood. Hoods. And Boston, in fact, for uh, black athletes from the 1960s through contemporary periods has been a place mm -hmm. uh, considered to be hostile uh, to African Americans. Even those great Celtic teams, which had mm -hmm. Bill Russell and mm -hmm. Casey Jones, you know, the notion was that Boston was not a friendly place to to black players. What would Charles Sumner think of that? I what would Charles think? He'd be disappointed. I'm sure he would. Yeah. So, so that's a great contribution. Mm -hmm. To, uh, to American life, and I guess uh, folks in the culture are drawing lessons from that, that in fact this is a model yeah. uh, for how racial integration can succeed in America. Are there other uh, aspects of American sport that have had an important role? I think one that's forgotten about now was the use of athletic rhetoric and uh, athletic 
images and analogies in the early 20th century by progressive politicians in both the Republican and Democratic Party mm -hmm. to sell to the general public the notion that the government needed to be the umpire in mm -hmm. the American mm -hmm. economy. And Theodore Roosevelt in particular, and even Woodrow Wilson. Does he want to kill the umpire though? I mean, is that? Well, and it's certainly yeah. there are those factions <laughs> who would still like to do that, right, in American politics. But uh, they very, uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson actually was a football coach as well as a faculty at, member at, at Westland. At Westland. Yeah, and, and, well, in Viewed in football at Princeton mm -hmm. as president of Princeton, mm -hmm. you know, pushed he came football to the culture, games, though, came to the right. games, but he was a, a fairly good football coach for, I think, just a year uh, when he started his career at Westland. And there were geniuses on the political stump. You know, they're trying to find language to talk to the American public about the need for regulation, the need for rules and structures, for constitutional structures to protect the interests of all mm -hmm. uh, in an era where the perception is that government needs to play a larger role role and they find the perfect analogy in sports in umpires fair play fair play mm -hmm. uh, and what the government is supposed to do is see fair play uh, and they use it William Howard Taft did as well so Democrat or Republican I think uh, that language it, it certainly wasn't the sole uh, driver of that shift in American politics and the economy but created the notion that the big state uh, was necessary to balance out the powerful uh, interests of, of I guess business. that's sort of implicit, though. I guess it refers to cards in the notion of the New Deal. Mm -hmm. We're going to give you, and then a fair deal, a fair deal, uh, yeah. game playing as the uh, as the basis for American social and political life. And, and certainly Franklin Roosevelt, although not quite the uh, athlete that his uh, distant cousin was. Um, Franklin Roosevelt, who was sports editor of the Harvard Crimson, was he, was used he, his play. Uh, nothing, actually. He, they, yeah. hence he was sports editor of the Harvard Chris. He tried to play various sports, but was not a particularly talented athlete, so he ended up writing about sports. But he was imbued in that, you know, that Ivy League uh, uh, sports culture and used the same kind of analogies uh, on the... Um, on the uh, campaign trail and in other places that Theodore had, so yeah, it builds through. Even some of the uh, the, the nameless, faceless Republican presidents of the twenties use similar rhetoric. Uh, mm -hmm. Herbert Hoover, uh, who was the manager of the baseball team at Stanford, would often use sporting analogies, um, and uh, in, in different ways. Since Hoover had a, a slightly different political philosophy, his notion was the empire shouldn't do too much. The empire, you know, should not help one team against another team mm -hmm. just because one side seemed to be winning. So he, he pivoted those analogies to, to argue for less government uh, support in, in, in the early stage of depression. Is, 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 short is, is the umpire an American invention? Uh, no. I mean, certainly there are, um, 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 in, in, in that particular term in baseball, but so there are certainly referees and umpires in, in British team sports as well. In, in, in Varieties of football and rugby and soccer and in and in cricket and in uh, in other sports. So it's that's something we inherit from um, the British, but but use for our own purposes. Well, it's really been fascinating. Uh, this is a line of inquiry that's uh, fresh for us here. It's new and 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 uh, it leads in some very interesting directions. We're looking forward to your talk. Uh, do you want to just briefly say about what what your talk will be? I'm going to talk. Um, the title is uh, the British Invention of Modern Sports, and I'm going to try to tackle some of these questions about the roots and origins of modern sports and assert that they're Western, and then talk about what that means because we do have a global sports culture that the most popular programs on television in the contemporary world are World Cup soccer and the Olympic Games. Sport is enormous in Western and non-Western cultures alike. And so just how much of the West is carried in the cultural vehicle of sport? Does, does the fact that sport is the language of the global village make the global village a more Western mm -hmm. uh, burg than we thought, or uh, is sport pretty darn plastic and maybe doesn't carry um, very well uh, Western structures and attitudes as much as Thomas Hughes, the author of Tom Rex, mm -hmm. they thought it did. Well, we'll be eager to hear it. Thank you very much.